Hello everyone and welcome to Mycobiology. My name is Wes Swenson and I'll be your instructor for the semester. Featured here are a couple pictures of myself. On the left is me um, teaching science to children in a science program. And on the right is a picture of me with a few of my kitties. Uh, it doesn't just stop there though. I have many pets. I have uh, five cats, two dogs, four chickens, a goat, and a rabbit. I'm currently finishing up my last year of my PhD candidacy at ASU. Um, what I do is I uh, genetically engineer cyanobacteria, which are little algae, in order to make them produce biofuels and industrially relevant compounds. So in this image, you can see we are uh, growing little cultures of uh, algae and they have different phenotypes. They're green and yellow phenotypes based upon their mutations. And we have a LED panel behind them and little filters that allow uh, filtered air to blow through and aerate the cultures. And we also do this on a larger scale. Um, this is a photobioreactor that's on the roof of one of the ASU buildings. And we are um, essentially capturing um, the biofuel in that column in the front. And it's being filtered through a, uh, a membrane that collects that biofuel. And then we extract it from that membrane. So now that we have introductions out of the way, let's talk about the course itself. As you know, this is microbiology, Bio 205. It's a four credit hour course. I'm the instructor. Um, you can call me Wes or Wesley. And my email address is wesley.swenson at scottsdalecc.edu. Um, you are required to check your email, your Scottsdale email regularly for updates, lab data, reminders, changes to the schedule, um, any sort of announcement, um, and you will be emailed to your Scottsdale email. We won't use any um, uh, off-course emails for this, um, for these reminders and messages. Um, if you don't know how to check your email, it's real simple. Just go to www.scottsdalecc.edu forward slash students and click on the student email on the right side. There are several required materials for this course. The first is the textbook. The textbook is free to all students. You can access it through the OpenStax website. I've included a link for that here. Um, you will also need to be able to use Google Cloud products such as Google Docs, Google Sheets. You will need Microsoft's. You can download Microsoft 365. Uh, instructions for that are on the Canvas course page as well as on the Scottsdale homepage, and it is free to any student at Scottsdale Community College. Finally, and very importantly, you need to have computer or computers that allow you to access and use these tools. Just as you were to, just as if you were to take a uh, upper division math course that might require you to have a special calculator. Um, this online course requires you to have computers that allow you to access and use these tools. Now let's talk about the meat and potatoes of the class and that is the exams. The exams will focus on concepts developed within a unit that has different lectures and labs as a component. So they will be a combined lecture and lab based exam. These exams will include multiple choice matching, fill in the blank essay or problem solving questions. Uh, students must write in complete sentences that are correct in grammar and usage of the English language. Um, each exam will be available for a time slot of three days and you can refer to the schedule in order to see exactly when those days are. Formats for the exams may vary. They might include writing definitions, writing or drawing or diagramming, a description of a microbial process, those sorts of things. Makeup exams require a doctor's note, a court summons, etc. Um, otherwise, it is the student's responsibility to avoid scheduling conflicts. These exams are closed note, a closed friend, a closed book. 
you are to prepare your own minds for taking these exams. Um, and uh, these exams will also be using the Respondus Lockdown Browser on uh, the Scottsdale Community College website on Canvas. So in other words, you won't be able to switch to other windows. It will monitor uh, your test taking. You shouldn't be using any other electronics or any other sort of aids in the process of taking this exam. After you're done taking the exam, you cannot share that information with other students. Do not share your notes from the exam. Do not show share your notes for studying prior to the exam with other students. This is something that you should work independently towards. If you would like to study together, that's okay. Okay, next are the lab assignments. We will be having 13 lab experiments, which are worth 20 points each. And you can see the lab schedule for topics and due dates. Um, there is one library lab, and that library lab has the experiment, as well as a library project, which is a writing assignment, and that is worth 80 points. Um, and then you do have the, again, the four uh, combined lab and lecture exams, which will be worth 100 points each. Lastly, there will be checkpoint questions. Checkpoint questions are questions that will be embedded through the recorded lectures that will have um, um, basically five points Total, I'll probably have about five questions per lecture. So what you want to do is you want to write down each question. Go ahead and pause the video if you need some more time. Write down each question. And then you will submit your answers to the Canvas assignments page. These checkpoint questions will not appear on the PowerPoints I post. They will only be in the lecture that I give. And so in a way, these are sort of participation points. And points to make sure that you are staying current and paying attention to the lecture. And so this is what all of that looks like put together. You have the four combined lecture and lab exams worth 100 points each. That's roughly 47% of your grade. That one library lab writing assignment worth 80, 80 points. The lab reports that are worth 20 points each for a total of 260. Checkpoint questions, I believe we have, I think it's 24 lectures so a total of five points each will equal 120 points you may get a total of 860 points in this course now we may have to update this um, this point breakdown as we go along if, if we have lectures that are canceled you won't have you might not have checkpoint questions for that lecture and uh, you know things might come up and we'll adjust this in the uh, the canvas gradebook as we go along now, this is a online course and a study as you as we go on your own time. So attendance is a little bit different here. Um, what you're expected to do is to stay current on the weekly lecture and lab content and complete all assignments on time. Again, exams will have a three day um, um, time window for you to take them. And you're expected to take them within those three allotted days. Um, you can miss up to two labs maximum. Um, however, uh, labs are an essential component of science. So if you miss more than two, it, it doesn't matter what your excuse is, um, we will not, um, ex we, you will not be able to pass the class and you will be dropped. Um, you just will not uh, learn the material necessary in order to be uh, fluent in microbiology. Labs will be closed after the due date and they can be reopened with the instructor permission. So if something happened, you can reach out to me. Um, I can reopen these exams um, and you can resubmit them with a 10% deduction from the total points possible per week that they are late, up to two, two after the due date. And when we jump over to the lab schedule, I'll kind of show you how that works, the point deduction system. Uh, if you have any special circumstances, such as uh, being a student athlete and you have practices or games that you have to attend, I don't know how that plays out 
um, this semester. Or if you have any registered disability accommodations, please alert me today um, as soon as possible so that we can make accommodations for you. This is a four credit hour course, and that's going to require you putting in a minimum of 10 to 12 hours a week. And so I have a few tips to help improve your learning. Um, one is to always review the previous lectures, uh, PowerPoint slash notes before you do the following lecture, just to kind of entrain your mind and refresh your memory of what you learned in the previous section. The next is to become an active learner. So um, when you read through these PowerPoints and watch the lectures, go ahead and, and shoot me an email, ask me some questions. Um, there are no dumb questions if you learn a lesson from it. Uh, and answer questions too. So, you know, sometimes I might ask some, ask some questions. Go ahead and see if you can answer those questions yourself. Um, there, again, if you're an active learner, you're more likely to learn the material and retain the material. So there's no failure if you learn better. Next is to develop consistent daily studying habits. Um, avoid, when you're studying, avoid eating, playing on social media or streaming services while you do that studying and so you can stay focused on the task at hand. And um, in microbiology, some of these concepts require you memorizing tedious details um, instead of broader concepts. And one of the best ways to do that is to just buy a, a deck of three by five note cards and have them on hand. Take some notes of some of those tedious details, maybe write the answers to them on the back and maybe, you know, a, a sentence or something on the front that you have to answer. And when you have extra time, you know, maybe um, instead of getting out of your phone, if you keep those note cards on you in your, in your book bag or in your pocket or whatever, you can pull them out and just kind of do little mini reviews. This is what this course schedule looks like for this semester. In the left hand column, you have the week that you're supposed to do the given lecture or the lab or the exam. So we can see we're, right now we're going to start off with chapter one um, for the first lecture. For the second lecture, we're going to finish up on chapter one and we're going to do chapter two. And that's all due this first week of class. On the lab column, you'll see that you have different labs. So we'll have lab one, which is a Canvas assignment on classification. At the end of each week is when your checkpoint questions are due and your lab assignment is due. So the checkpoint questions for chapter one and chapter finish chapter one and chapter two are due on the 30th, which is a Sunday. You can turn them in earlier, but that's the final day that they are due. Lab one also, again, uh, the latest you can turn in that assignment is the 30th at 11.59 p.m. So I'm going to scroll, scroll down a little bit further here. Okay. I want you to hone in on September 21st to the 27th. Um, here you see we'll have an exam review. Um, I always have an exam review before an exam. And then October 28th through October 4th is when your exam one is going to come into play. So exam one, you will have the window of October 4th through October 6th to take that exam and complete it. Uh, and if we pull out any one of these labs here again, lab number five, it's for the week of October 28th through October 4th. So what day will it be due? That's right, October 4th. Let's scroll down here to the bottom. Uh, actually, we have a couple of days where we have holidays and we won't be having labs. So we have Labor Day um, here. So for that week, we won't have a lab uh, for Veterans Day. We won't have a lab. And for the Thanksgiving holiday, we won't have a lab for the Thanksgiving holiday. We also will not have a lecture. So no lecture for one of those days um, for the first part of the week. We will have one lecture. OK. Um, 
And the final exam will be available from December 13th to December 15th. So let's scroll down here. I have a little guide for you. Okay, we have a lecture section guide and a lab schedule guide. So um, again, we've already kind of discussed this, but there are two lectures per week. Um, usually, you can see the schedule above for details on that. Each lecture will have a set of checkpoint questions embedded in the lecture itself. That's not in the separate PowerPoint slides that I'll make available online. The checkpoint questions are always going to be due that final Sunday of that week before 11.59 p.m. So for example, the checkpoint questions for the two lectures of this first week will be due this Sunday, August 30th at 11.59 p.m. There are no late exceptions. There are no late submissions for checkpoint questions. So that'll close and we won't reopen those. Again, those are participation points to make sure that you're kind of staying up to date with the lectures, right? Okay, so the lab schedule guide, um, I've included a series of examples to help students along. So each lab, again, is going to be due on the final Sunday of the week it is scheduled during. So for example, lab one will be due on August 30th at 11.59 p.m. through Canvas. Always submit your assignments through Canvas. I will have uh, um, them available through the assignments portal. Labs will be closed after the due date. Um, if you want to ask for special permission, I can reopen them for submission for a 10% deduction. Moreover, there will be another 10% deduction made for each additional week. Um, no labs will be accepted later than two weeks. So the example one I have here is a student misses the lab, um, lab one due date and requests an extension. They, ex they submit that lab somewhere between August 31st and September 6th, 11.59 p.m. It doesn't matter if they submit it on August 31st or September 6th, the student will still receive a 10% deduction from the total amount of points possible. The second example is uh, lab one is submitted on September 7th at 12.01 a.m. Um, in this example, the student is just late by a couple of minutes, um, but unfortunately, those couple of minutes are over that second, that first week. So therefore, the student is late two weeks and will receive a 20% deduction. And the final example is when a lab is submitted on August 13th at 11.59 p.m. The student will receive simply a 20% deduction. However, after this point, the lab no longer becomes available. So after midnight, it's gone. So that's, that's all the opportunity you had. And remember, you cannot miss more than two labs in order to pass this course. So that's all of the syllabus um, and the general components of this lab that I'm going, lab and lecture that I'm going to cover. Please read that syllabus in more details. Um, we're going to move on now with the uh, chapter one. So I have a little bit of a first day to do list for everyone. Um, the first is I would like you all to um, uh, think of some questions about chapter one. And I would like you to email me an introduction of yourself, um, who you are, uh, what your background is, and um, you know, if you want to tell me a little about, of, about your work or your life, that would be wonderful. Um, the second or slash third part are checkpoint questions. So there's going to be checkpoint questions in chapter one. So remember to write those down. And then uh, I don't have it posted yet. Uh, it's the first week, so I'm a little crammed with time. But I'm going to have the, uh, the assignment page posted under assignments for you to submit your answers to each one of those checkpoint questions. And remember that's due before the end of Sunday this week. And lastly, we're going to cover uh, chapter one lecture. So let's jump right in. All right, chapter one, an invisible world. So before we begin, let's talk about the definition of microbiology. 
So biology, um, bio is, uh, is life, and uh, ology is the scientific study of something. So this is the science that studies living organisms. And micro essentially just means extremely small. Microbiology essentially studies microorganisms or microbes, which are extremely small uh, living and it can even be non-living organisms that cannot be seen with the unaided eye. This term encompasses a wide diversity of things. If you think about it, microbes can be unicellular organisms or multicellular organisms. They can be prokaryotic or eukaryotic, which we'll talk for later. They can be heterotrophic or autotrophic, and that basically has to do with their types of metabolisms. Um, they can be life-sustaining organisms. Um, so these can be organisms that make different foods for us or keep us our microbiome healthy. Um, or they can be life-threatening as well. So these might be organisms that cause uh, diseases. Lastly, even our body is made up of microorganisms. So as we just alluded to, the microbiome is made up of microorganisms and the cells that compose us, a multicellular being, are made up of micro, um, uh, you know, cells, which are essentially little microorganisms themselves. It might not seem like it to us, but microbes span a wide range of sizes. If we look at this microbe scaling chart, we see a period character in Helvetica type 12 point size is about 500 micrometers in size. Let me get out my little laser pointer here. So a period of Helvetica type is about 500 micrometers, also known as microns in size. So the largest we're going to be dealing with is uh, the amoebas or protists and um, they can be up to 300 micrometers in size so some of these can be barely visible to the naked eye the naked eye just means you cannot see them uh, you can see them without the aid of a microscope we have uh, other protists as well we have paramecia we have diatoms and please feel free to go ahead and take some time and read through the, the uh, definitions of these different microbes. Euglena, here we get to uh, baker's yeast. Baker's yeast is about 10 micrometers in size. So baker's yeast is about 1 50th the size of a period. So these are orders of magnitude smaller than a period. And down here at the bottom, we start getting into bacteria. So Escherichia coli is basically the lab rat of bacterium. It's, it's the most well-studied bacterium we have right now. Um, it's found in the digestive tracts of uh, humans, of animals, um, in the intestines. And uh, it is roughly, it says here, about two micrometers. It's a... Uh, pill-shaped bacterium, so it's about two micro micrometers by one micrometer. So one five hundredth the size of a period. Um, these baker's yeast and E. coli, we most certainly cannot see with the naked eye. So as you can imagine, almost all of these require a microscope to visualize as individual cells. Many are beyond the capability of the microscopes that we use, that we would use in class. So let's continue. Um, here we have other types of bacteria, lactobacillus. We use those to make foods such as yogurts and other fermented products. Cyanobacteria um, are those groups of photosynthetic organisms that I study. We'll get into cyanobacteria later in the semester. Uh, Staphylococcus are bacteria that are found on your skin. Um, most are harmless, but some can cause uh, disease. Uh, now we're getting into uh, viruses. Now viruses 
are another level of, of, uh, of size altogether. So here we're still, you know, we're still hitting about the micron size with these bacteria. Viruses uh, take a big leap down. Here they're about 0.3 micron. Here we see all the way down to 0 0.03 micrometers in size. So we went from 30 micrometers to 0 0.03 micro micrometers. So this rhinovirus is, what is it, one ten thousandth of the size of the protist that we were looking at earlier. So this already kind of gives you a glimpse as to how diverse uh, microbiology is in its scope of study. So we're about to look at an extremely diverse group of organisms in this class. So much so that this class really only scratches the surface of what we know about microbes. In fact, a study um, done by Indiana University in 2016 predicted that there are a trillion species of microbes, 99.999% of which have yet to be discovered. So of course, there must be a system for keeping track of all of these microbes and living organisms in general. And how we do that is uh, we classify um, or living organisms into different groups. Here you can see the organization goes from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. For humans, that would be Animalia, Chordata, Amelia, Primates, Hominidae, Homo, and Sapiens. Each one of these groups, the members within that group become smaller and smaller. The genus species category is the full name given when referred to an organism. So we are Homo sapiens. So the naming of microbes has a certain convention. And this is very important for you to follow. So the entire genus species name is all italicized. The genus, the, the first letter in that name is capitalized. Um, everything else will be lowercase. Examples of this are Escherichia coli. Here we can see the whole name is italicized. The first letter of the first of the genus is capitalized, but the C in the species name is not. Now, after the first time that you use the genus species in a article or a paper that you write or an answer that you give on an exam, you will then refer to it in this format. So the genus then becomes shorthand and it's abbreviated to just the first letter, still capitalized, period, space, then the species. And this throws a lot of people off because your word autocorrect will try to capitalize the C. Make sure that's always lowercase c. E. coli is named after the German bacteriologist Theodor Escherich and colon is so that's where it gets its name from. Now here we have our second example, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Saccharomyces cerevisiae comes from the root words myces, which is fungi, and saccharo, which is sugar, and cerevisia, which is beer. So this is sugar-eating fungus that makes beer. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and as we can see, all italicized, capital S, lowercase everything else. Uh, now that we've mentioned it once, we will abbreviate the genus to capital S period, cerevisiae. And finally, here we have Salmonella enterica, and um, it is named after Daniel Salmon, who discovered it, and entero is Latin for intestines. So here's your first checkpoint question. What is the correct way to write the following name? Synecocystis elongatus.
The spelling's all correct. We just need you to make the changes to the way it's supposed to be written down. And when you can answer this question in the checkpoint questions on the assignments, make sure uh, the convention is correct, whether it's italicized or not. I hope that was long enough for all of you to write down that question. Now let's get into the different types of microbes. Microbes are highly diverse. We have bacteria, we have archaea, fungi, protozoa, algae, viruses, and helminths. And we're going to try and briefly cover each one of these uh, microbes today. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of microbes, but these are microbes that we will be covering in class. For checkpoint two, I want you to name one reason why it is important for us to study different types of microbes. So try and come up with a unique reason why it would be important for us to study microbes. Um, feel free to look at uh, some of those different microbes we had listed or to wait until the end of this lecture and see the different type of microbes and what they do. Okay, so the first one is bacteria. So we're going to discuss um, traits that all bacteria have. Um, first on this list is that they are unicellular. So bacteria can form uh, complex communities with other bacteria, but they're still considered unicellular organisms. They don't require multiple cells in order to be, uh, um, in order to function and be alive. <clears throat> they are also Prokaryotic. Uh, most of you should already know what prokaryotic means by now. Um, you should have taken a, a high school biology course or some college courses. And if you don't recall, uh, prokaryotic basically means this is pre-nucleus. A nucleus is a organelle or a membrane limited um, uh, area that within that membrane <coughs> contains their DNA. Also, bacteria reproduce by something called binary fission. And this is an asexual reproduction, so it doesn't require a male or a female or other types, sex type, in order for this reproduction to occur. And for right now, uh, we don't need to get into a whole lot of detail. But um, binary fission basically involves one mother cell. So imagine this one cell. And what it does is it forms a uh, what they call an invagination or these little dents about in the midpoint of the cell. And within those dents, you have a membrane that grows across. And so this, you see this gray area, this is a membrane. And so you get a membrane that goes all the way through. And these two compartments break away from each other, and two daughter cells form uh, as a result of this. And we'll talk about this more during my, uh, microbial growth, so don't feel overwhelmed about understanding that process. The other thing is they have circular chromosomes. Chromosomes are the uh, main part of their DNA that um, exists in the cells, and these actually uh, are a complete circle. So it doesn't have an end. One end just marries into the other. Um, in eukaryotes, that's not the case. We have linear chromosomes where there's a, two ends to the uh, chromosome. The other thing is their cell walls contain a compound called peptidoglycan. And their metabolisms are very complex and they can uh, function in a variety of ways. <clears throat> so they can be heterotrophic or autotrophic. And that means um, what they eat in order to get their carbon. So heterotrophic uh, organisms, they have to eat something else that's already made organic molecules for them. So an example of heterotrophic would be humans. Autotrophic organisms can take CO2 from the air or other inorganic carbon and fix it, which means to create 
organic molecules from it. And the example that we're all familiar with with autotrophic organisms are algae and plants. But many other organisms can do that. They also can swim with the use of a flagella. So if you look at this organism here, it kind of has this mouse tail. This is called the flagella in bacteria. So here's a review of what peptidoglycan is. And um, there's a lot going on here, so just bear with me. But if you look here, we have two different types of bacterium. We can have a gram-positive bacterium and a gram-negative bacterium. And these categorize uh, a bacteria on the way that their peptidoglycan forms. So remember, this is that compound that's in their cell walls. And the book should have this capitalized. This is from OpenStax. Um, Gram is named after the scientist who studied uh, peptidoglycan. So this should be a capital G named after him. But as you can see, um, there are um, several compounds you need to be aware of. So if we look at this bottom um, caption here, we'll see that we have N-acetylglucosamine, and these are the little blue circles here, and it's abbreviated NAG. And then we have a, another compound called N-acetylmuramic acid. And these two are actually connected to each other through a pentapeptide and a tetrapeptide. So these little balls here, these little green ones and these little yellow balls are actually um, five amino acids in pentapeptide and four amino acids in tetrapeptide. Uh, if you do not recall what amino acids are, please review um, the basic four biomolecules of life. So um, again, we have these N-acetylglucosamines and N-acetylmuramic acids, and these are derivatives of carbohydrates or sugars. And the sugar would be glucose here. And, and again, the uh, N-acetylmuramic acid is a derivative of glucose. The gram-negative um, uh, peptidoglycan layer does not have this pentapeptide here, but rather these tetrapeptides are directly linked to each other. So gram positives uh, usually have a much thicker peptidoglycan with many layers, whereas the gram negative is a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. While we're talking about bacteria let's, and their cell walls, let's discuss a little bit about their shapes. Shape is very important because it's often the first step in identifying an unknown pathogenic bacterium or any bacterium. Um, there are three main different shapes in bacteria. There is caucus, which means, which is Greek for spherical. So they can be spherical or ovoid, like in this first example here. And this first example, um, if you look carefully, you see you can see that little invagination of the cell wall here and here on many of these organisms, many of these bacteria, and that's the process of cell division occurring. So if you look at this organism right here, it's about to divide, and soon it will look more like these two right here. And eventually, these will break away completely to start a new, uh, a new um, <clears throat> cell again and start dividing again. So um, a caucus cell might often come in pairs or it might even come in several uh, chains linked together. And we'll discuss what that uh, phenotype is in a moment or later. Number two here is bacillus. <clears throat> and bacillus means they, well, they kind of look bacteria-like. They're sort of pill-shaped or rod-like. And this would be the second image here. So this is a, an example of a bacillus bacteria. And this is a little confusing because some bacteria are actually also named after their phenotype. So we can have a streptococcus pneumoniae or a bacillus cereus, and they get their names from their phenotypes. 
The next is spiral. And so a spiral is essentially a, a spiral. They have a corkscrew shape. And here we see in this la last image, a corkscrew shape. Okay, so for now, that's enough about bacteria. Let's discuss archaea. Archaea are unicellular as well. They are also prokaryotic, so they lack a true nucleus. They have more like a nucleoid region, so they don't have a membrane-bound chromosome. They also reproduce by binary fission, and we got to see some great examples of binary fission in that previous slide, which is an asexual form of reproduction. A meaning without in this sense of the word, the prefix. They also have circular chromosomes. So they're looking uh, very similar to us as bacteria, but they're not bacteria. They're very different in other ways we'll get to later in this, um, this course. Their cell walls, for example, do not contain peptidoglycan. And these little dudes often live in extreme environments. So they're often categorized as what we say are extremophiles. File, it means lover of. So they're lovers of the extreme. And also, as stated in the textbook, they are not known to cause diseases. There are three main groups of archaea. There are the methanogens, so gen to generate. So this means that they generate methane. So during their carbon metabolism, they will end up, so while they're consuming com compounds that contain carbon, their end product, their waste product, is something like, is methane. Um, we have the extreme halophiles. So halo means salt. So we have salt loving and they live in extremely salty places. And next we have the extreme thermophiles. And in this case, thermo does not mean cold, it means hot. These are hot loving and they live in hot, often sulfurous water. Now, I have this article here because there are often many exceptions in biology, and this is one of them. So if you remember earlier, I said that from the textbook and many other textbooks and sources, they say that um, archaea are not known to cause diseases. And we're starting to punch some holes through that uh, hypothesis. So this paper is a review, review article about how uh, methanogenic archaea that live in our intestinal tracts, um, the methane itself might be a gastrotransmitter, as we see down here. And it says, archaea are the only confirmed biological sources of methane in nature. And methanorevibacter smithii is the predominant methogen, methanogen in the human intestine. And this is linked and has a strong association between delayed intestinal transit and the production of methane, or in other words, constipation. So stay tuned on that. Okay, now let's jump to fungi. We're getting a little bit weirder here now. Uh, fungi can be both unicellular or multicellular. So obviously, not all fungi is microscopic. They, uh, they are what we call eukaryotic, so they contain a nucleus. So they have that membrane, and inside of that membrane uh, is a, a sac that holds their chromosomes. They can do both. They can reproduce asexually or sexually.
Their cell walls do not contain peptidoglycan. However, they do contain chitin. Chitin is the same substance that forms the exoskeletons of many insects. They are heterotrophic. So if you remember, hetero means um, that they're getting their uh, organic compounds from something else, something different. So they don't produce it themselves like in photosynthesis. So um, even though you might see them as green, don't be fooled. They're not photosynthesizing here. Examples of molds include, or fungi include molds and also uh, yeast. So uh, sir, remember the uh, um, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae? That was the uh, fungi that eats sugar and makes beer. That is a fungi. So the yeast that are used to brew beer and wines, etc., are yeasts. Okay, now let's discuss, discuss protozoa. So we're getting a little bit bigger here. Protozoa, remember they were um, as big as, uh, I believe it was 30 microns in size. Protozoa are, sing are unicellular or single celled. They are eukaryotic. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. They can be free living. So that is there, they, they don't live inside of another organism or they can be parasitic. The Plasmodium falciparum that you see in the upper right is a, uh, is a protozoa that actually causes malaria. Amoebas are mostly um, free living. They can be heterotrophic or autotrophic. Next is algae. Um, algae uh, are typically thought of as being unicellular, although they can be multicellular as well. Um, I'm not gonna have that on an exam just because the textbook says one thing and I don't wanna be contradictory there. So not all algae are technically microbial. Um, and that's obvious for sushi before because what do they roll up your uh, sushi with? Well, they use kelp. Kelp is a type of algae and it's multicellular. Uh, they can be eukaryotic or they are always eukaryotic, pardon me. So they have a true nucleus. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. The cell wall is not composed of peptidoglycan. It's not composed of chitin but it is composed of cellulose, which is a carbohydrate that is um, organized in a special way. They are autotrophic, so they photosynthesize and they capture their own CO2 or fixing. They fix that CO2 into organic compounds, such as cellulose and sugars and other compounds. So they're capable of photosynthesis. Okay, um, algae can be used for a variety of products. Again, they can be unicellular, technically, or multicellular. Um, cyanobacteria are sometimes grouped as being algae, but I wanted to point out that cyanobacteria are not eukaryotic, they're prokaryotes. So uh, don't let the textbook confuse you on this one. Um, they, are, they just happen to be green BCs that float in the water and so a lot of people call them algae, um, but that's not technically true. Um, if you look here at the bottles, you'll see that, that drink and it has spirulina in it, which is a algae that has a corkscrew type shape. Um, and uh, it is edible and healthy for you apparently. All right. Now we're getting really small. We're going on the other end of the size. We're gonna look at viruses. Viruses are extremely small, even for a microbe. 
they are acellular and we're going to talk about this more later but they actually are not made up of a cell at all um, although if you look at this image of uh, hpv human papillomavirus you know if if you're not very well aware of what makes up a cell this is not a cell and we'll talk about that later in the semester when we get to a cellular um, pathogens they are often pathogenic Although there are so many viruses, not all of them are pathogenic to humans. But they require other life forms in order to fulfill some of their basic functions. So because of this, they are not really alive. They cannot reproduce or metabolize independently. Um, rather, they, they serve more as a source of genetic code that hops from one living organism to the next with some sort of a shuttle or in order to um, you protect that uh, genetic information until it finds a new host that can metabolize and reproduce for it. They are composed of genetic material, DNA or RNA, and they are surrounded by a protein capsid. We will never see viruses using typical light microscopes. The image you see here on the right is done with what's called an electron microscope, a very expensive piece of machinery. Next up are helmets, and helmets are a whole different horse amongst themselves. So we're getting a lot more complex with these helmets as far as uh, uh, cellular uh, um, division of labor. Helmets are animals. And as such, um, they are multicellular and they have nervous systems and they are um, much more complicated than the other organisms that we spoke of so far and that they have cells that have very specific tasks. Um, they are parasitic worms and they can exist either as round worms or flat Again, they're multicellular animals. They are only microscopic during certain life stages. And they are quite horrific, some of them. So if we look at this hookworm over here on the side, they can enter the host by burrowing through the skin. And these hookworms that are present in the southeast can be transmitted by people walking barefoot. Um, their microscopic stages might include their eggs and their larva. All right, checkpoint three. B. anthracis, Bacillus anthracis, is the bacterium known to produce the toxin anthrax. What shape does B. anthracis exhibit? Go ahead and pause the video again if you need to write down those that question. We're going to leap forward here. All right, checkpoint four. Here we have this article. Underground lake of liquid water detected on Mars. Recent satellite data indicates that there is a large amount of extremely salty liquid water underground on Mars. If this water were inhabited by a microbe from Earth, what type of microbe would it likely be? So think of the different microbes that we listed in this discussion. And you tell me what type of microbe it would most likely be. All right. Now the final checkpoint, checkpoint five, an unidentified microbe is found to reproduce asexually, contain a nucleus, and possess a cell wall made of chitin. What type of microbe is this? Okay, so let's talk about why one would want to study microbiology. So one important uh, role that microbes play is in a process called element recycling. 
Microbes are the only type of living organism that can capture atmospheric nitrogen and convert it to a form that is usable for others. Nitrogen makes up about 70% of the gases in our atmosphere. This is the case because it is an extremely stable compound that is very hard to oxidize. So it comes in the form of N2. However, nitrogen is one of the four main ingredients that comp comprise biological organisms. Uh, we need it because there's an essential biomolecule called amino acids that make up proteins. And so living things need this nitrogen in a usable form in order to survive. And there are certain microbial species that are the only living organisms that can convert night atmospheric nitrogen or N2 into usable oxidized forms and amino acids. So if you think about humans, we can't breathe in nitrogen and make amino acids. We're not breatharians. We uh, consume products that have proteins in them and we break those down into their constituent amino acids and we use those amino acids to build as building blocks. This is also the reason why you often use nitrogen fertilizers because the nitrogen fertilizers contain some sort of an oxidized form or uh, some sort of form where the nitrogen is fixed from its uh, from its atmospheric N2 form because it's really hard to get enough nitrogen in the soil. Another thing we use uh, microbes for is sewage treatment and bioremediation. And this is where microbes can break down contaminants and toxins found in sewage or waste from industrial processes in order to um, make them uh, more environmentally friendly. Next up are food and drink. Microbes are essential for producing a lot of our fermented foods and beverages. This includes yogurt, pickles, saccanaut, beer, wine, chocolate, the list goes on and on. And they are very important in newer forms of biotechnology besides food biotechnology. And these are um, uh, processes such as genetic engineering, uh, medical usages such as producing human insulin. We produce human insulin uh, typically in yeast or animal uh, cells and cell culture. Industrial products such as biofuels, plastics, food additives, and material biosciences. And for providing gene therapies for humans. Here we have Luxturna. This is a treatment for an inherited retinal disease that causes um, uh, seeing issues in humans. And this gene therapy actually uses a, a what's called an adeno-associated virus. And this is a type of virus that is benign to humans, but we use this as that shuttle. Remember we talked about is needing a shuttle and that's usually their what you see them as when you see them in pictures is they use this adeno associated virus as a shuttle to move in genes that correct that that um, mutation in humans with this disease microbes are very important to us in our human microbiome so the human body is composed of about 30 trillion cells, and it is believed that they cohabitate with about a one-to-one -one ratio. So there are about as many uh, microbes as there are human cells. So perhaps the most intimate way that microbes affect human welfare is through the human microbiome. Imagine if you took away all of the human cells of the human body and leaving just behind the mic just behind just the microbes, you would still be able to find your way around that body. Microbes are essential for digesting our foods. They provide us with vitamins. They prevent other pathogenic microbes or invading microbes, the bad ones from taking up residence. They also are believed to be involved in certain signals to our brain and to the rest of our body.
The microbes that live stably in and on the human body are called the human microbiome. So yes, like I was saying, the microbiome is seated at birth and maintains our health throughout life. Here's an interesting study on that. The title is Partial Restoration of the Microbiota of Caesarean-Born Infants via Vaginal Microbial Transfer. And they show that babies that are born of a C-section are uh, un underrepresented in certain micro microbial population. Okay, so let's discuss uh, Synlogic. Um, Synlogic is a biotechnology company, and what they're interested in doing is taking bacteria and giving them uh, the ability to produce certain compounds, whether that's enzymes or other compounds that, uh, that human bodies might need. And you see in the uh, right, in the left column, there are a series of different drugs in the pipeline that help correct metabolic diseases that are seen in humans. And in the, uh, the different columns, you can see we have screening, lead discovery, lead optimization, IND enabling studies. And, and now some of these are actually entering into phase one, um, into phase two trials to see if we can use these microbes in order to uh, recorrect these inherited genetic disorders or possibly even cancers. So an example of this would be uh, the urea cycle disorder, which is characterized by excessive ammonia production in the blood and a genetic inability to break down that ammonia into urea. So, very interesting. This was an interesting paper that came out uh, about building the bio-based economy. So, in biotechnology, we use feedstocks, so this could be uh, biomass, which could be uh, forest ref, uh, byproducts from the logging industry, it could be algae, methane, waste, and off gases from plants. And we feed those into industrial biotech cultures. So we grow big vats of, of culture. So instead of making beer, you're growing um, microbes to make something else. So this involves some sort of synthetic biology where these microbes are engineered um, with different enzymes, and then you go through a biorefining process. I mean, you might need further gene editing of these microbes, but ultimately we're going to build products. So there are many different products we can make. We can make sustainable fuels. We can make uh, uh, industrially relevant chemicals. We can make different polymers such as plastics and, and other coatings and things that are used in industry and also food ingredients. So just as we can make foods, we can just as well as make ingredients for other foods. And this is very big business. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised by these numbers. So here we're going to look at revenues for the US company for the United States in 2012. And if you look at this pie chart, it's broken down into three categories. We have red biotech, and these are called biologics. And these are complex organic molecules made from uh, living organisms, from microorganisms, such as the insulin we discussed, uh, or it could be some antibodies that are produced, or uh, a, whole, a whole slew of different things, like the adenovirus, uh, gene therapy we discussed, that has a $91 billion of revenue in the United States. Um, GM crops are not really uh, microbial in nature. Um, they can be, but for the most part, this this is like your, you know, your GMO corn and soy, etc. Next, we have industrial uh, biotechnology. I think this might be surprising for some who think that uh, medicine is kind of the blockbuster for uh, revenues, but actually industrial microbiology brings in over $105 billion as of 2012. It is also the fastest growing industry amongst the three.
So um, that wraps up today's lecture. Um, we will finish up chapter one in the next lecture. Uh, thank you all for being patient and listening to the video. And uh, I hope to see you in the next round. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, and also remember to submit your answers through the, the quizzes portal on Canvas. So this would be checkpoint questions one. Thank you.